Hello and welcome to the Atoll, your home for Waterworld fandom. In today's long anticipated video, we'll be looking at everything we know about the 1997 computer game known as Waterworld, the quest for dry land. So without further ado, let's load up that CD-ROM, move our soldiers into position, and find the true location of dry land. But before plunging into the complete playthrough, I would just like to talk briefly about the development and release of this game. Now, longtime viewers will know that I covered some of this topic in my previous video that looked at all of the released and unreleased Waterworld games, but regardless, Waterworld The Quest for Dry Land is a top-down real-time strategy game developed by Intelligent Games and published by Interplay Entertainment in 1997, which follows a band of atollers as they compete for survival among the other warring tribes on the endless seas of future Earth. And I actually have to start this video off with a bit of a correction to my previous video on the Waterworld video games. It has been long rumored on the internet that the quest for dry land began development in a completely different genre of gaming as a arcade style on rail shooter. However, recently, Games That Weren't.com has released new revelations about Interplay's actual plans for the Waterworld IP. It seems they employ two separate development teams to create two separate games, with Intelligent Games creating the more traditional real-time strategy game, the one we'll be looking at today, and Software Creations heading up the action shooter game, which looked to be an overall more ambitious project, especially for a movie tie-in game. And learning more about this unreleased Waterworld shooter game has become a bit of its own rabbit hole that I've been researching concurrently while writing this script, so I'd actually like to save that whole story for a future video, so be on the lookout for that one in the coming months. But back to the quest for dry land, as stated, the game was developed by Intelligent Games, a British team based in London that specialized in creating games oriented around pre-established brands like the PGA Tour. And I find it totally fascinating that this game was released two years after the release of the film, long after the buzz around the movie had died down. From what I have learned, the game began development around the time of the film's completion with images of gameplay, snapshots of FMV, and even a picture of a demonstration booth being published in gaming magazines in fall of 1995. So I have to suspect that something behind the scenes, most likely something to do with the troubled production of the other Waterworld title by Interplay, caused the quest for dry land to have such a delayed release. But regardless, let's first have a look at the game's box art. I unfortunately only own the game in this jewel case which curiously lacks the game's subtitle, The Quest for Dry Land, which seems to be a common thing among the American releases of the game. Far more impressive, however, is the big box version of the packaging which had region-specific variations, like this box from Europe that uses a photograph of the open atoll gates as the hero image on the front, and check out this variation on the CD printing which shows the trimaran. But I do have to point out that the packaging that has the computer-rendered ocean background utilizes the title font from the very beginning of the film with these pointed arches on the W's. And to my knowledge, this is the only piece of Waterworld merchandise that utilizes the actual title treatment as seen in the film. Included in the big box is also, of course, the instruction manual, which I have a copy of here, and I have to say, I really like this reimagined gold version of Enola's tattoo here on the front. Inside the manual, we have all the typical kind of information you would expect, like system requirements and how to install and play the game. However, the manual also gives us some nice establishing lore in this plot background section which sets up the world and the society of the Atollers, as well as the opportunistic smokers that raid these communities. This section also makes mention of the Mariner, calling him a quote, genetic throw forward to what man will evolve into on the water world. It also makes much ado about his extraordinary fighting abilities, more on that in a minute. 
But this section concludes with telling us that we will not be playing as the Mariner, but as the Warchief, who will be strategizing attacks as well as defending our own Atoll. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's fire up the DOS emulator and jump right into the game because as we will see, it very much has its own story to tell, complete with its own bizarre timeline that really needs to be seen to be believed. So upon starting the game, we are welcomed with some opening logos, including this wonderful pixel art version of the Universal Pictures logo. And then we land on the game's opening title screen and credit scroll. And it is here that we get our first taste of the game's musical score, which I feel very nicely captures the otherworldly orchestral score presented in the film, but sort of pushed through this DOS fantasy game filter. It will feel instantly nostalgic to anyone that played games from this era. Continuing onwards from the title screen, we are presented with the game's first bit of full motion video. Yes, if you didn't know already, the quest for dry land has extensive live action video interludes that push much of the game's narrative forward. And this was a hot trend among games published around this time, largely thanks to CD-ROMs, which greatly expanded storage capacity, allowing for the playback of video files. And famously, or at least famously among us Waterworld fans, these cutscenes see some of the original cast reprising their roles and using props, costumes, and set dressing from the film. And so in our first video, we open on a shot flying over the ocean, and we begin to hear a voice telling us about how Waterworld came to be. It almost sounds like an ancient myth or an old religious story, that all the water came from a single drop of hydro, and that the first atolls were created from the remnants of the gods that lived on Earth before the Great Deluge. And then our first character fades on screen. It's Gregor. However, as you can see, this Gregor is not played by Michael Jeter like in the film, but rather John Fleck, who actually played the smoker doctor in the film. It's definitely an unexpected bit of recasting, but I actually don't mind Fleck's Gregor. He's not quite as animated or affable as Jeter, but he still carries this sort of genius aloofness that also defines the character. Gregor goes on about how he knows that, in fact, people lived on vast stretches of dry land at one point in the past, but that the melting of the polar ice caps flooded the world. He concludes his monologue by saying that all that is left is the story of the one god that closed its eye and left humanity adrift. That is, until the eye opens again and shows the way to a new home. Let's keep all of this in mind for later in the game. Progressing past the game's opening fair, we arrive at the top menu, which gives us a variety of familiar options, with the exception of this choice of large versus small graphics, which I found adjusted the field of view in the game with large graphics being more zoomed in and small graphics being more zoomed out, but regardless, I started my new adventure with the default large graphics on. Upon starting a new game, we are immediately presented with an open diary that is read to us through audio voiceover. As we will see, these diary entries work alongside the live action cutscenes to tell the narrative of the game. This first account informs us that these are in fact the writings of the War Chief, who is working tirelessly to hold back attacks by the Smokers and other factions on Waterworld. A month ago, the Smokers tore apart the War Chief's Atoll, leaving him and his people adrift on rafts and looking for a new home. Next, we get a video clip starring another Waterworld alumni, Zake Smoke, who has reprised his role as the Atoll Elder, or Atoll Leader as he's known in the game. The Atoll Leader is floating on a small raft and gnawing at some sort of twig, while the War Chief, facing away from the camera, paddles the raft forward. The Atoll Leader says they are in dire straits, but that he encountered a drifter that morning that told him the location of another Atoll. And here we see some of the reused and repurposed 
footage from the actual film to tell the story in the game. It appears that the drifter they encountered is the same one that the Mariner encountered in the opening scene of Waterworld. The Atoll leader says that we will set sail for this new Atoll and take it by force if we have to. This leads us into our first mission briefing screen, which shows us an overhead shot of the level that we're about to play and a voiceover from the war chief tells us what we need to accomplish in it. In this first level, called First Blood, we are basically just attacking this poor random atoll and destroying the jetty in the middle where the main force of enemies are held. Next, we encounter the game's resource management screen, where we can allocate weapons and pickups to our small band of warriors. For this first mission, I gave each of my soldiers a crossbow, and since I did not have any pickups, continued on to the first level. In this first mission, our warriors arrive on a small raft and... <laughs> To be honest, the people we are attacking are no match for our arsenal of crossbows. Also, upon arriving, I immediately picked up this piece of paper. More on that in just a minute. But for this first mission, I basically just navigated the perimeter of the atoll, taking out enemies along the way. I reached the jetty and with a single click, blew the whole thing up. Mission complete, we secured ourselves a new home. Following the mission, we then progress to this scrapbooked piece of newspaper in our journal, presumably that piece of paper we picked up at the beginning of the level. It appears to be from the year 2044, with the main article here telling about how the world's books are being destroyed by the ocean's rising water, and the concern that humanity's knowledge base will become erased. This is all clearly an homage to how paper, books, and in particular magazines are greatly valued in Waterworld as small windows back to the world before the water began to rise. As for the other text on these pages, it all seems to be little jokes with a good dose of British humor. It's talking about toast, and I think this is a reference to Princess Diana, and then there's this car ad that alludes to the band Queen, and I think Cadbury Cream Eggs? We then come to this blood-stained entry in our journal that talks about how we ruthlessly attacked the poor people of this atoll that we are now calling home. I'm kind of starting to feel like we're the villains in this game. But regardless, we go back to live action where we get our third returning Waterworld actor, the great R.D. Call, playing the now beardless atoll enforcer, the lawman of our atoll society. He informs us that we are going to die of quote hydro starve because our desal machine has stopped working. He tells us that he knows of another atoll with a working machine and that our tribe's survival depends upon us attacking once again another atoll and stealing their resources. And you will notice that an actor is playing the war chief in many of these scenes, though we never really see his face as it is often out of frame or he's being shot with his back to the camera. The actor that played the war chief is Vincent DiNardo, one of the game's producers that worked at Interplay in the 90s. And studying his outfit, I think he's actually wearing the Nords costume from the film. We then cut to a new set and get our first scene with the fourth returning Waterworld cast member, Jack Keller, who plays the Atoll Tally Man. And I love Keller's performance in these cutscenes. He really has his character locked in and very much portrays the Tally Man as this sort of conniving yet calculative numbers man. He tells us our next mission will be dangerous, but certainly worth the risk. And if we lose some soldiers in the process, not a big deal, because for the tally man, that's just less mouths to feed. But regardless, we get a page showing us the leveling up of our warriors, then a page showing us the supplies we have, and then some pages showing us the weapons we have at our disposal, as well as an entry describing the helpless faction we just steamrolled, known as the Brothers. The entry is just dogging on them, basically saying it's their fault that they had to give up their own home. 
Our second mission, Blood for Water, has us stealing the desal machine docked in the center of this atoll on a barge, but first our troops are going to have to pull a lever to open the gate so that the barge can slip out into the open ocean. After the mission briefing, we encounter a new screen, the Trading Post, which allows us to buy and sell supplies before starting each level. Each item has an assigned metal, hydro, and dirt value. For this second mission, I sold my machetes and hammers and stocked up on even more crossbows. On to the resource management page, and we have two new troops. Everybody is getting a crossbow, and we begin the mission. In my first go of this mission, I scouted the perimeter once again, but lost a few guys while moving through the level too quickly and loosely. It's important to note that in this game, when a soldier dies, they will no longer come back and you lose all of their experience, so in this case, I chose to restart the mission. On my second attempt, I found success by moving slower and having my weaker troops fall back. I dodged some spikes, pulled this lever, and boarded the barge, making a clear break with all six troops intact. We again return to our journal, which has a new entry for the handgun, our first firearm weapon. We also check in with the warchief through this journal entry, where he confesses that he does not trust the fortunate position we have found ourselves in. He suspects a smoker attack. However, as we can see in the next cutscene, the tally man is very happy about the new supply of hydro. But the tally man, who actually in this scene says he kept track of supplies for the smokers at one point, criticizes the war chief for taking in survivors and making them part of our new society. Then suddenly from the watchtower, we are alerted that smokers are approaching. And here we get some nice b-roll from the actual film. Yeah, peppered throughout the entire game are unused shots from the production of Waterworld. I will highlight some more of these as we go along. The third mission, First Defense, is just that. We must hold off an attack on our new home from the Smokers, who will be going after our new Hydro machine. At the trading post, I load up on handguns and ammo, and I distribute the weapons among my expanded roster of troops, and this time we also have some pickups to hand out as well. Nowhere in game does it explain what these icons represent, however in the manual, I do have this handy reference guide that tells generally what all the pickups provide for our troops. Before beginning this level, we are presented with this screen that allows us to drop our troops among several different locations in the level. After playing through the level a few times, my winning strategy was actually to put a large group of inexperienced soldiers down here by the atoll gates and a smaller but more leveled up group to the north. For the group at the gate, I hid most of them behind this barrier and placed one of them in this machine gun turret which protected the less experienced soldiers now only armed with crossbows. The northern group I kept near the desal machine and allowed the smoker army to come walking one by one into my barrage of pistol fire. And in pretty quick order, we eliminated all the attacking smokers. Mission complete. After mission 3, we are treated to some more b-roll of the atoll getting attacked in the film, followed by a new weapons page for the blunderbuss, and a new tribe page for the smokers, which informs us that they have become more organized and lethal in recent encounters. We then get a journal entry telling us that a group of fishermen from our atoll were captured by the smokers as they retreated. The war chief is willing to risk it all to rescue his fellow atollers. Mission 4, Rescue, has us infiltrating what I guess is the smokers' very own atoll. We are to invade from two different locations and convene upon a cell holding the prisoners on the far side of the atoll, then make our way back to the boat we arrived on. Now, with a nearly full roster of characters and more pickups and weapons to distribute among them, I placed all of my men on the more northern jetty and created a huge wall of destruction to overwhelm any opposing forces. And overwhelm we did, creating a huge pile of bodies right where we arrived. 
Eventually, I sent a low-level troop wearing speed boots to scout ahead, but unfortunately, he succumbed to a few smokers hanging around this lever to the north. I then decided that we were more powerful traveling in numbers, so I directed the entire squad towards the lever. The lever lowered some spikes that allowed me to acquire another piece of paper. I then made my way down to the prisoner cell, busting crates and collecting pickups before releasing the captives. I proceeded back to our boat across the middle of the atoll, and this is when I discovered that you cannot control the prisoners that you're rescuing in these types of missions. This caused me to panic and race for the boat, but luckily, we only encountered minor losses. Upon finishing Mission 4, we discover the contents of the salvaged piece of paper. It's a blueprint for explosive tip crossbows. I have a feeling our stockpile of crossbows got a lot more potent. This is followed by another bloody journal entry saying that the mission was a success, but not without its sacrifices. And this is followed by another visit to the Tallyman, who praises us for acquiring new weapons from the attack on the Smoker Atoll, but that our people are quickly running out of food. And actually, the gun that the Tallyman is handling in this scene is Nord's gun as seen in the film, which ironically was recently up for auction on eBay. But regardless, we are given a new weapons page for the single barrel shotgun, as well as a new journal entry stating that we have caught up with the Drifter from the beginning of the game, which we suspect has led the smokers to our new atoll. But rather than use the Drifter for fertilizer, we interrogate him and get the location of another atoll with a plant barge, perfect for feeding our hungry troops. Mission 5, there for the taking, is very easy and straightforward. Attack this small atoll and harvest it for all its resources. At this point, I had a full roster of troops, so I jumped right into the mission. We pulled up on a raft and quickly discovered that the new explosive tips on our crossbows were very effective. We simply destroyed all the enemies, which appeared to be smokers, and took all of the pickups and weapons we could carry and jumped back on the raft. Mission over. We then go back to the journal where we learn that we had in fact interrupted a smoker raid on the small atoll. But regardless, we caught him off guard and were able to acquire even more resources than we had expected, including vegetation to start our own orchards. The cutscene that follows shows a gleeful tallyman celebrating the spoils of war, but warns us that the smokers will be back to reclaim their supplies and weaponry. Also, check it out, there's a box of smeat in the background here. And, back in our journal, we get a new weapons page for the double-barreled shotgun. Mission 6, Cut Garden, has us again defending our atoll at night against the smokers. And during this mission briefing, I realized that our atoll has started to transform and gain new additions when compared to the overview map from the first mission. After outfitting my troops, I evenly distributed them among the three starting points, which in hindsight might have been a bit of a mistake as my more experienced troops in the north were immediately ambushed while I was organizing my less experienced troops to the south. I got the situation under control, but at the same time my southern troops were now under fire, but luckily they had some protection from the gun turret. After the initial bloodshed, I noticed that things got really quiet, so I began to look around and I found a large horde of smokers that seemed to be glitching out in the center of the map. So I sent one brave shotgunner, wearing speed boots and a white vest, to quickly take them out with his spray shot. I then spotted one last strangler, so again I sent out the shotgun and BAM! Mission complete! Our next journal entry tells us of how things are quiet for now, but that the atoll leader has a strange look in his eye. In the cutscene that follows, we find ourselves in a new set, the atoll leader's quarters. He busts in, saying he has news. 
he tells us that one of our prisoners, which yes, I guess we have prisoners now, was in fact an inventor and that he has shown the atoll leader a drawing of what he is calling the eye of God, some sort of invention that could show the way to dry land. The machine has been in the inventor's family for generations, but it has not worked since he was a child, but the inventor believes that he can fix it. However, the smokers have commandeered the eye of God. The atoll leader says we must have it. We then cut to just outside the atoll gates where, lo and behold, the mariner arrives on his trimaran. What could this possibly mean? We then get two journal entries. The first is a reaction to the Atoll leader's news, where the war chief has mixed feelings about the Eye of God, but believes that if the smokers valued it so much, that it must be worth having for ourselves. The second journal entry talks about the arrival of the Mariner, who in the game is a mercenary for hire. Interestingly, the Enforcer says he has met the Mariner before and that he is a great fighter. The War Chief admits that he is expensive, but he may be worth it to secure the Eye of God. Mission 7, The Eye of God, question mark? Has us invading another Smoker Atoll, searching several locations for the Eye of God before making it to an escape raft. Entering into the trading post, we are welcomed with a heroic little audio cue, and check it out, the option to purchase the Mariner. He is quite pricey, but after selling some supplies, I had enough to acquire the Mariner. Upon starting the mission, I rounded up my troops, but the Mariner, who you're not able to control in the game, immediately took off on his own and basically became a one-man army charging into the enemy base with reckless abandon. After taking out a good amount of guys, I moved my troops up to this tower, but they announced that the Eye of God was not there. I then moved my company towards this jetty, and a large battle broke out, with smokers spawning in from everywhere. My troops told me that the Eye of God was also not on the jetty. I then headed down to this lever and pulled it, and upon scrolling back to the north, I caught the mariner ditching the battle, diving back into the ocean. Well, I guess he had seen enough. I then took my troops to the south and out this peninsula, which had been protected by spikes before I pulled the lever. Here I grabbed a ton of supplies and another coveted piece of paper. After a little bit more scavenging, I made my way to the raft and the mission was complete. Immediately following the mission, we get a look at that piece of paper we collected, another magazine article. This left side is from the year 2157, and the main article talks about a giant seawall that was built in Wales that collapsed, causing chaos as people seeked higher grounds. This is actually one of the same articles printed in the back of the instruction manual, which I covered in a previous video on how Waterworld became flooded. On the right side is an advertisement for coats that are made of D's aglycol that are resistant to heat, cold, and puncture damage. But essentially what we're given is a key that tells us what the different colored armor are good against because as you'll see in the manual, the devs have been purposefully ambiguous about their benefits up until this point. And surrounding the two main articles are a lot of what I'm assuming are inside jokes among the developers of the game. Yeah, I'm not really sure, some of these are pretty weird. Next, we check in with the War Chief via journal entry, in which he explains that the Eye of God has been taken from the Smokers by another faction called the Laymen, and that the Laymen have some sort of behemoth at their disposal. However, the War Chief says that we need to refocus on gaining more supplies, and this is emphasized by the Enforcer in the next cutscene, who says there's a trading post ahead that we should raid to help bolster our stockpiles. He then slides a dowel into this wall with a radial design on it. Does anyone know what this is meant to represent? We arrive at Mission 8, Easy Target, 
where we will be raiding a potentially abandoned atoll. However, it seems a little too quiet, so we'll have to keep an eye out for any ambushes, aka enemies randomly spawning in. Starting at the raft we arrived on, I assigned a low-level troop to man this machine gun atop this tower to lay down some cover fire. I directed the main group to do a perimeter sweep of the atoll where we met our first enemy who seemed to be wielding a machine gun that quickly killed one of my guys. We made our way south going out this long dock section to collect a bunch of ammo and even further to the south we took out an entire horde of enemies and everything seemed to get real quiet when suddenly a bunch of opponents spawned in from the long dock section we had just explored. We made a stand between these two walkways, taking out enemies as they approached, and then moved into this area that had abundant supplies, but which also spawned in another wave of enemies. We took out this wave by creating a clinch point at the end of this walkway, but at this point I had lost quite a few men to the enemy's machine guns, so I decided it was time to go home. We made our way back to the raft, and the mission ended. We then get a journal entry explaining that the outpost that we just raided was run by the layman. We did, however, recover the layman's written logs and learned that there is a barge, for some reason spelled with two E's, that is run by a single man and is full of inventions and weapons. The war chief speculates that this man could help us operate the Eye of God if we ever got our hands on it. We then get a cutscene with the atoll leader who informs us that since we're in layman waters, we must capture the Eye of God and the inventor aboard the barge. And I'm guessing that this is the same inventor as the one we took prisoner and that told the atoll leader about the Eye of God initially before Mission 7? I'm not really sure, that inconsistency in the story is a bit confusing. But regardless, here we get a cutaway of the barge, which is clearly a b-roll shot of the smoker refueler barge from the film, probably just anchored in the harbor when it was not being used as a prop on screen. But in any case, suddenly we hear a shout from the watchtower that a monster has come up from the sea. But before entering into the next mission, I do want to mention that we get two more information pages in our journal, a new weapons page for grenades, and a new tribes page for the layman, which seems to imply that they worship electricity. And speaking of the layman, in a short follow-up entry with the war chief, he informs us that the layman's behemoth, an underwater ship, has surfaced in the middle of the atoll, which leads us to mission 9, behemoth. Time for another defense mission. To begin this mission, we have four starting areas around our atoll, but I opted to start all of my troops in this location closest to the machine gun turret. Positioning my troops behind this barrier once again, I was able to make a fordable stand as enemies walked right into our trap. And before I could even really get my bearings, I got a mission success. I believe this may be the quickest mission in the entire game. We then get a cutscene with the atoll leader and the enforcer, telling us that they know, quote, the birthing place of the layman, and that we need to strike before they can build more submarines. Also, I should note that this scene contains a really nice overhead shot of the atoll under attack, which is not present in any of the cuts of the actual film. And in our journal, we have a new weapons page for the machine pistol, which I'm glad to see we finally have access to. Mission 10, Lair of the Beast, has a small group entering the layman base to open their gate, allowing a second unit to come in to help destroy the behemoth at the center of the stage. At the trading post, I bought some new machine pistols and gave them to my most leveled up characters. And you may have noticed this as we've gone along, but as characters level up, they earn little badges. And I point this out now because Aaron here has earned a Ying Yang badge, which from what I can tell is the highest ranking badge you can achieve. 
Making our way to the mission, we can choose who will sneak in to open the gate and who will sail in on the boat. I used a smaller unit to open the gate and then I took the larger unit that sailed in on the boat for a sweep across the northern catwalk. After clearing enemies to the north, I used the smaller unit to clear along the south. I then focused back on the larger unit and took them towards the middle of the level where we encountered an enemy with what looked like a giant chain gun which cut down one of my troops. But having stood my ground, I gathered both units in front of the behemoth and blew up one of the barrels aboard which started a chain reaction destroying the entire machine. Mission complete. We then get the same cutscene of the Mariner arriving at the Atoll Gates. I have a feeling he's about to offer up his services again. But regardless, we get this journal entry that tells us that the Eye of God is being held in a battleship that the laymen control and that the War Chief's people believe it is their destiny to take it. Mission 11 USS Ticonderoga has our team traversing a giant ship to retrieve the Eye of God, which is sitting on the stern of the vessel. And yes, before going any further, the USS Ticonderoga is an actual ship, or ships that served in the United States Navy, named after the captured Fort Ticonderoga during the American Revolutionary War. Several ships have been given this namesake from sailing schooners to steam-powered warships to aircraft carriers, but the most recent ship with this name is the USS Ticonderoga CG-47, a guided missile cruiser commissioned in 1982 and active in the US Navy until being decommissioned in 2004 and brought to Brownsville, Texas for scrapping in 2020. So, perhaps the ship we are seeing here in the game is a future US Navy project that survived the Great Deluge and became commandeered by the Layman tribe. In the trading post, I opted not to hire the Mariner this time, remembering how he abandoned my boys back on Mission 7. Beginning the level, we start on a series of docks to the far south of the map. My troops actually took this guy out while I was initially surveying the level and lo and behold, it seems he dropped a piece of paper. We progressed to the north, taking out booby traps and enemies along the way until we boarded the ship and made our way to the upper decks, and this is where we encountered the layman leader, who shot at us with some sort of electricity weapon. We quickly took him out, but lost a few guys in the battle. The troops then made their way out this long catwalk and, at long last, we retrieved the Eye of God. We then made our way casually back to the raft we sailed in on, which in turn ended the mission. Looking at the piece of paper we picked up, it seems we acquired a grenade upgrade, along with this cheeky warning label saying that we should not use the grenades for carpentry, video recording, or food preparation. We also get this journal entry telling us that we have acquired the Eye of God, but still have no idea how to use or operate it. In the following cutscene, we get our first look at the Eye of God, this massive piece of mid-century electronics. The Atoll leader and enforcer debate on what to do next, but decide that they must tell the Tallyman that we now have the Eye of God. We then cut to an irate and maybe drunk tally man who feels that having the Eye of God will only bring unwanted attention from the other factions on Waterworld when all of a sudden a barrage of bullets start piercing holes through the atoll walls. And quickly flipping through our journal before the next mission, we now have a weapons page for the minigun. Wow, this thing looks like it's going to be a huge upgrade to our arsenal. In Mission 12, Tears Before Dead Time, the laymen have come to reclaim the Eye of God, so we must once again defend our home. And I realized in the supplies management screen that my army had really started to dwindle with only five troops still ready to fight. I was going to have to be much more careful from this point on. I put all of my guys in the northeast starting point since that was the closest to where the Eye of God was being held. 
we made a stand to the north, and then I took my troops south along the outer catwalk. All was quiet besides an enemy in our own gun turret, so I quickly took it out and mission success. We then get a new cutscene of the Mariner arriving into the Atoll Lagoon. I'm guessing that our hero for hire is back once again. In the journal, Warchief tells us that the people of the Atoll are restless with the news about the Eye of God, and that the Atoll leader has decided to keep his people focused and busy by raiding another Smoker Atoll for its fuel distillery. Mission 13, Go Juice A Go Go, has our troops traversing the length of a Smoker Atoll towards a barge with a fuel distillery on it, but first we're going to have to pull a lever to open the gates and free it. As predicted, we can hire the Mariner for this mission, and this time I opted to do so. I have not mentioned it before, but in the instruction manual, there's this section that gives tips for most of the levels, and these are actually pretty creatively written, being told from the perspective of one of the troops on the ground. For mission 13, it seemed to strongly suggest that we splurge for the Mariner, and so this seemed logical, especially because I only had four troops remaining. However, this backfired big time, as the Mariner was immediately hit by this flame jet and abandoned the mission seconds into starting it, so I restarted the level without the Mariner's help. On my next attempt, I moved my troops to this raised platform to the east and took out a massive horde of smokers, losing one of my guys in the process but also acquiring a lot of pickups beyond the spike barrier. I then made my way to the north and pulled the lever to open the gates but was immediately ambushed and had to quickly retreat. Luckily, my three remaining troops all had speed boots and could move incredibly fast. After taking out a few more enemies, we made our way to the barge and sailed out. Mission complete. We rejoined the Tallyman in our next cutscene where he's playing around with some Molotov cocktails and putting go juice on himself like cologne. He revels in all of the fuel and firepower that we have acquired in our last raid, but reminds us of how now that we're on top, everyone is going to want to knock us down. We then cut to some interesting unused B-roll footage of the Atoll being swarmed by enemies. In our journal, we have a new weapons page for the Molotov cocktails, and an entry from the War Chief commenting on how well supplied our Atoll is currently looking, but that we are still no closer to finding dry land. Mission 14, Surprise Attack, has us defending our Atoll once again, but against who? We are informed that they may be going for the Hydro Machine, so I started my three remaining troops to the north near its location. From here, I snuck along the catwalk to the east, and this is where I encountered a new faction of enemies, mostly comprised of these lumbering guys that, while slow, will kill you with a single hit if they get close enough. Keeping my distance, I made my way around the perimeter of the atoll until all the enemies were eliminated and we got a mission successful across our screen. Following the mission, the war chief reflects on the invasion in his journal, saying that some of the people are calling this new attacking faction the Choppers for the large bladed weapons that they wield. We then get a cutscene with the Atoll leader directing the war chief to go investigate an unusual looking boat just beyond the horizon. Perhaps this is the same boat we heard story of in the cutscene before Mission 9. Back in the journal, we have a new tribes page for the Choppers, which tells us they are not the most intelligent people, but that they make up for that with sheer strength. And speaking of, we get another journal entry saying that the barge we are about to investigate seems to be under attack, possibly by the Choppers. Mission 15, Inventor's Bargy, has us rescuing the inventor who has barricaded himself against the choppers. We will then make our escape by stealing one of the chopper's boats since it's faster than our raft. Upon starting the mission, I immediately noticed that this map was far smaller than anything yet in the game. 
I stationed my modest band of troops in the center of the level and started piling up choppers as they came streaming off of their boat. I then pulled this lever, lowering the spikes and allowing this prisoner to join our party. We made our way south, picking off a few more enemies and boarded the chopper boat, completing the mission. We're then back in the journal where the war chief explains that the barge is full of amazing inventions, including flamethrowers, but that unfortunately the inventor was not aboard. Wait a second, who was this that we saved in the previous level then? In any case, it seems that the choppers captured the inventor and took him back to their home atoll. Time for another fight, but before that, among our weapons page, we get more information on the flamethrower, which is sure to warm things up. Mission 16, Chopper Island, has us entering through the chopper's atoll gates and rescuing the inventor in the southeast corner of the map. Upon assigning weapons and pickups to my troops, I noticed I had a new member, Cameron. I guess this was the prisoner we saved in the previous level. Anyway, I loaded him up with a flamethrower and started the mission. Arriving on our raft, we got to experience the crazy spectacle that is the flamethrowers as enemies charged and we turned them into charcoal. We made our way around the perimeter using the catwalk, passing by this interesting shrine, this pool of sludge, and eventually coming into contact with the chopper leader who threw hatchets at my troops. After absorbing about a hundred bullets, the leader went down and we cleaned up the rest of the enemies in this area before pulling the lever and releasing the inventor. Another wave of enemies charged in, but again the flamethrowers went to work clearing a path forward. However, at the same time, the gate that we entered through closed, blocking our escape and the gate closing distracted me, allowing for the choppers to kill one of my precious few soldiers, R.I.P. Cameron. However, shaking it off, I sent one of my troops to pull the lever and reopen the gates. We then regrouped, traversed the atoll to our raft, and set out with the inventor in our care. Mission success. We then return to our journal where we learn that our troops have found chainsaws on the chopper's atoll, which also shows up as a new weapons page, and we also learn the name of the inventor. It's Gregor. In the cutscene that follows, we find ourselves in the tallyman's quarters as Gregor investigates the Eye of God. He tells us that the Eye of God is a navigational device that links up with satellites in the sky above to tell the user where they are on Earth and what lies ahead. The tallyman wants to know if Gregor can fix it, but Gregor says that we will need a bigger power source to run the machine and that the only generator capable of doing this is on the smoker's main atoll. Mission 17, Power to the People, has us once again facing off against the smokers on their own turf. This time we're going in to capture the barge containing the generator. In this smaller level, which sort of looks like an offshore oil platform to me, my troops quickly made their way to this lever when I noticed a booby trap shooting missiles in all directions, which seemed to be killing more smokers than anything else. In any case, we took it out and cleared the remaining enemies fairly easily. The only thing left to do was board the generator barge and get out of there. Another mission completed. In our next journal entry, the war chief tells us of the positive mood among the atollers as Gregor sets to work on the Eye of God, now powered by the generator. In the following cutscene, we join Gregor as he turns on the Eye of God for the first time. It seems that dry land may now be within our grasp. We then return to the journal where the war chief tells us that we are now traveling towards dry land, under the guidance of Gregor and the Eye of God, but also that we are traveling through unknown waters and that we must remain alert. A cutscene with the Atoll Enforcer follows, with him saying that we passed a drifter sailing fast in the opposite direction we are heading. The drifter warned the Enforcer of someone or something called the Organo people and told him to stay away. 
All of a sudden, much like in previous defense missions, an off-screen watchman yells that a fleet of boats are approaching. Mission 18, Meet the Meat, has us again defending our atoll against an unknown enemy. The warchief does not seem overly concerned, but he does note that the gun turret near the gates is out of commission, so we cannot rely on that for defense. However, I did decide to start my three remaining troops in that area since we had luck holding down that part of the atoll in past defense missions. Right away, these pale weirdos started moving in on us, and while they did move very quickly, they also died pretty quickly as well. After the initial onslaught, I surveyed the rest of the atoll, which all seemed very quiet. I made my way back to the invader's boat, and taking a step on it triggered an all-out ambush. My three fully kitted troops went to work, and within a few minutes had taken them all out. Mission completed. In our journal, the war chief is disgusted by the savages we fought off, known as the Organos. It seems they ended up capturing some of our own people, but we've tracked them back to their home atoll. We also get a new tribes page for the Organo, which states that their religion centers around an obsession with recycling any and every living thing, including themselves. Mission 19, Caged has us moving across an organo atoll towards a series of cages to the north. The problem is we don't know which cages contain prisoners and which contain more enemy soldiers. Beginning the mission, my troops made their way up to the four hanging container crate prison cells. Pulling on the lever next to each cell sends it across this chasm and releases the people on the other side. The first lever I pulled released a prisoner who quickly joined our party. The lever also lowered the spikes protecting this piece of paper, so I sent a troop wearing speed boots to go retrieve it. The second cell had two more prisoners and seemed to trigger a few more organo soldiers to come out and attack. It appeared that the third cage contained only enemies, and unfortunately in the ensuing attack, one of the rescued prisoners was killed by a crossbow. The fourth and final cell contained one prisoner who also quickly joined our party. We then collected a few more pickups and made our way to the raft. Mission accomplished. The piece of paper that we picked up gives us the blueprints for an improved minigun which, along with some more humor, seems to give us added accuracy and damage, a very welcomed upgrade. Then we get a journal entry telling the depravity of the Organo people who build rafts out of rotting waste and human bones. Luckily, the rescue mission was a success, however, the war chief fears retaliation from the Organo people. Mission 20, We'll Meet Again, is another defense mission against the Organos. Fortunately, from our last mission, I finally acquired a few new soldiers to join the fight. Again, I had everybody start near the atoll gates, and immediately Organos started swarming in. We held our ground in the southern section of the atoll, using this narrow catwalk to funnel enemies in to our wall of death. The newbies started to get low on health, and not wanting to lose any more troops, I had them fall back. I took the stronger soldiers closer to the boat that the Organos arrived on, and using this set of stairs as a clench point, drew more Organos into the bombardment of my superior troops. This level had a ton of enemies on screen, and the bodies really started to pile up, and to be honest, in my first attempt of this level, I did experience the one and only software crash of this entire playthrough. But regardless, I continued to chip away at the Organo army until finally we eliminated them all and got our mission successful text box. In our next journal entry, we learn that the Organos just keep coming with seemingly endless numbers. The Atoll leader says it's time to take positive action. In the following cutscene, we actually join the Atoll leader who tells us the inventor has bazookas, also known as splatter tubes in this game, that could help us finally eradicate the Organos. Also in this scene, you'll notice the Atoll leader is tending to his tomato plant. 
I go into the legacy of the tomato plant in Waterworld in a separate video here on this channel, so check it out if you haven't already. It's secretly one of the best videos here on the Atoll. We then cut to the tally man who is very excited about the prospect of the splatter tubes. Just then we get word that the mariner has entered the atoll once again. I guess he's looking for another gig. Back in the journal we get a new weapons page for the bazooka and from the description it seems that this might be the longest ranged weapon in the game. Mission 21 Get Fluffy, and I have no idea why it's called that, is all about purging the Organos. To be honest, I did play this level with the Mariner and Bazookas, but it was a total fail with the Mariner quickly getting overwhelmed and leaving the battle, and it seems to me that the splatter tubes are very slow at reloading and not all that effective. I should also mention here that when you fail a mission, you do get a cutscene with Gregor, speculating what would happen if no one ever found dry land, that perhaps it would be a good thing as nature could flourish without mankind trying to conquer it. So on my second attempt, I used a more tried and true arsenal of weapons. Again, I let the less experienced troops hang back while my stronger troops forged a path of destruction. I made my way to this western walkway and encountered the Organo leader who's wearing this large cartoon style mask, which can also be seen in statue form in the northwestern corner of the map. Does anyone know if this is a reference to something? In any case, we quickly took out the leader with our miniguns along with a few other stragglers and that was enough to complete our purge. Mission accomplished. Our next journal entry says that by defeating the Organos, we can now fully concentrate on finding dry land. Gregor says that it isn't far and the Atoll Weathermaster says that good winds will fill our sails tomorrow. We then get a cutscene with the Atoll leader giving an alarming speech about how the smokers have in fact made it to dry land before us and are pillaging its natural resources in a deluge of evil and insanity. The Atoll leader tells us it's our destiny to protect dry land and ends his speech by chanting fight, fight, fight. We then get our final journal entry in which the war chief speculates that the smokers were trailing us to dry land and when we were busy fighting the Organos, sailed ahead of us. We have only one option, we must fight for dry land. Mission 22, Dry Land Assault, has us attacking the Ds, which has already made landfall. We are also informed that the Deacon is aboard and that we have an extremely tough fight ahead of us, but that it's worth every bit of effort, as dry land is the ultimate reward. And a tough fight it is, especially with my limited amount of experienced troops. I ended up restarting this level many times before I ultimately developed a winning strategy. And interestingly, if you lose this mission, you actually get a special cutscene with a mournful Gregor adrift at sea who tells us that we are just one in a hundred other atolls, fighting for survival but ultimately destined to drown in the end. However, on my winning run I used mostly miniguns with my troops starting to the south on this long dock coming off of the Ds. Making my way up the dock, suddenly my troops went out of control. I think it was a glitch as they began running in the direction in which we had just come. Ultimately this resulted in my three less experienced troops dying but for some reason I chose to continue the level and not restart the mission. I regained my ground and made my way to the deck of the Ds. Here I fanned out the three remaining troops, creating an even wall of destruction for the smokers to walk into. Then out of nowhere the deacon came strolling up the deck. He seemed confused by the fanned out formation, unable to decide which of my soldiers he wanted to focus his fire on, so instead he just stood there and did nothing. <laughs> I think this was a glitch, but in any case, we took advantage and quickly cut him down with our miniguns. We then made our way towards the stern of the ship, picking off smokers as we went. We arrived atop the bridge and all seemed quiet besides this gun turret in the very rear of the ship which was very much still armed and dangerous. 
To win the level, I had to take it out, so I rounded up my small band of troops and rushed in. Ultimately, the maneuver paid off as we destroyed the turret and completed the mission. We then get our final cutscene, which begins with this b-roll shot of Dryland's beach from the film. The Enforcer says that dry land is hard to stand on, but that he could get used to it, while the Atoll leader rejoices at the discovery of an endless fresh water supply. We then cut to the tally man, announcing that he is officially going to stop counting. We then turn to Gregor, who says that we can once again live as we were meant to live, to be fruitful and multiply, which I think is actually a biblical reference. We then cut abruptly to the plaque commemorating Hillary and Norgay as the first mountaineers to summit Mount Everest, once again reinforcing the fact that dry land is in fact the top of the world's tallest peak. And that's where the game closes out. We get dumped back into the opening title and credits, ending our journey where it began. Now that we've experienced the entire game together, I'd like to finish out this video with some of my own thoughts on it. And I'll say right at the top, I really adore this game. I think it being the only story-based Waterworld video game makes it feel like it really expands our knowledge of the universe while also creating its own story. And I think it stands as one of the main pillars of the fandom beyond the film, alongside other important pieces of media like the Ulysses cut, the comic books, the novelization, and even the stunt show. But let's delve a little bit deeper into what specifically makes the game so interesting and fun to play. Let's begin with the overall presentation. I like all of the menu screens and you can tell quite a bit of energy went into crafting the images of the weapons and pickups that you exchange at the trading post, as well as the pages of the journal that you visit in between each of the missions. And, of course, I greatly appreciate that each of the soldiers gets a name and a photographed headshot. I think this one little decision goes a long ways towards the player developing an attachment to the army that they are building. I think some might feel that the graphics in the game look quite similar from level to level, but I feel that if you look for it, there's quite a bit of nice detail and bespoke pixel art nestled into each of the maps. And the sprite animations of the characters on screen also look great, and your soldiers will actually change in appearance as they become more leveled up. Also, I can't forget to mention that some of the death animations are grisly, like this eye-popping one. And of course, it's great that after you kill an enemy, the body remains, allowing you to really see the path of destruction as you make your way through a level. As stated earlier, I love the music in this game. It very much feels like the score in the film, but with its own 90s fantasy computer game aesthetic. I especially like this low key track that plays in the resource management screen. The weapon sound effects are also quite good and help to sell the warfare presented on screen. There's a ton of great voice acting as well, with troops yelling things like, you're gonna be plant food, as they charge into battle. The enemies talk quite a bit as well too, especially the Organo people have some great one-liners. You were born such big fodder! Swamp them in death! I should also point out that all the journal entries and mission briefings are read aloud, which I think is another show of quality here in the game. The Bargy seems to be under attack, possibly from the choppers. We can't allow them to take it. We'll report in full later. The gameplay itself is, well, very simple, but I don't necessarily think this is a bad thing. Most of the levels are straightforward with you just gathering your troops into a mass, finding a good choke point to funnel enemies through, and blasting away. It's all a little bit brainless, but quite satisfying at the same time. The levels are typically short, but I felt this made for good pick up and play gaming. I could easily bang out a level or two in a short session and feel quite fulfilled by the progress that I had made. Perfect for a casual gamer like myself. 
Though I have to admit, moving from atoll level to atoll level did get a bit repetitive and it did feel like there were some fluff missions in the middle of the game, especially those missions against the layman and chopper tribes. So I do think that the game would have benefited greatly if it offered a way to break up the levels more, perhaps by having sea warfare levels where you could command an army of boats and jet skis instead of just troops on foot. I think this would have made the world feel a bit bigger as well. Perhaps the game could have offered more infrastructure building on your home base too. All of this could have been fleshed out in a sequel perhaps, maybe with a title like the battle for dry land. It definitely makes you think. However, the game offers a surprisingly deep assortment of weapons and pickups and a resource management system to organize it all that feels almost a little unnecessary given the simplicity of the actual in-level gameplay, but is still very welcomed. But for sure, some of the gameplay is a little janky. Sometimes the troops AI will pick strange paths when navigating across the level and I have to say in my experience with the game, the Mariner was a complete letdown as an NPC for hire. I also noticed some issues when fighting enemies on stairs or on different elevations within the levels. But of course, for me and perhaps others that follow this YouTube channel, the game's most important aspect is its story, the universe that it exists in, and the strange alternate timeline it creates within the Waterworld canon. It totally fascinates me how this game uses characters and concepts from the film, but places them on their own adventure that largely ignores the plot of the film. And this was likely done simply to have a story that would better tailor itself to the RTS gaming genre, but it is a bit surreal how in-universe and out-of-universe this game feels all at the same time. But I do really enjoy a lot of the new ideas that the game brings to the Waterworld universe. It's captivating to see the other tribes like the Laymen, the Choppers, and the Organos. And I think it's interesting how the game replaces Enola's tattoo with the Eye of God as the instrument to find dry land. And I feel this was probably done because the Eye of God becomes a good way to frame a story around collecting various resources in order to operate the machine. And it's also curious how in the game, characters and events get altered like how Gregor is this mysterious loner living in a fortified barge, or how the Mariner is this professional soldier for hire, or how in this timeline the smokers actually make it to dry land first. It's all so weird and feels a little off brand, but is in fact more interesting for that. And sure, the story itself is kind of shallow, basically a tale of survival propelled forward by the hope of finding dry land, essentially the same plot as the film. But I feel the simplicity of the story can be forgiven because of the way it's told through the live action cutscenes. The game producers actually hired one of the uncredited writers from the film to help with the dialogue in the game and this certainly comes through as there's a lot of instances of in-universe terms being used like hydro, go juice, and chits. And it's a real treat to see the actual actors reprise their roles using costumes and props from the film. And for hardcore fans, it's also fun to see unused shots from the movie pop up in the cutscenes too. But yes, it's all very campy with the cutscenes being shot on a soundstage with broadcast video cameras on a modest budget of $40,000. But for me, it just kind of adds to the charm of it all. And where the cutscenes may sometimes stumble in the storytelling, we have the inclusion of the journal entries to help glue the whole experience together. And yes, I'm certainly coming at this as a huge Waterworld fan first and a gamer second, but I've got to say, I had a great time playing this game. I think for some, the shortcomings can't be overlooked, but for me, it exudes a goofy allure that I can't resist, and its strange retelling of the film only draws me in more, wanting to know where this alternative timeline will lead us. I think it's a game that I will certainly be revisiting again soon in the near future. 
And before I wrap up this video, I just wanted to give two quick shout outs if you'd like to learn more about this game. First, good friend of the channel McCall45 also has a complete playthrough of the game on his Twitch channel, so if you want to watch a true gamer completely demolish this game while making great commentary, do check out his VOD. I mean, just check out this final army he amasses. All yin yangs here. Also, I'd like to shout out John, aka the UK film nerd, who is really the first person to write about this game here on the internet. His article has a lot of great insight into the mid-90s gaming market that the quest for dry land was released into, and even has an interview with Michael Conti, the producer and director of the live action cutscenes. Links to both of these great resources in the description below. Yeah, wow, this was a long video, but there you have it. That is my exploration of Waterworld, the quest for dry land. Thanks for sticking around to the very end. I know that in recent months, the YouTube algorithmic eye of God has shown a lot more light on this little corner of the internet, so if you're new here, I would just like to give a rousing welcome aboard. It's been wonderful to see so much continued support of this ongoing fan project. But before you go, say hello in the comments. Let me know if you enjoyed this video, if you've played this game, or if you'd like me to make more videos on the other Waterworld video games. Also, be sure to check out the Atoll on Instagram for even more Waterworld content. But with that, thanks, as always, for joining me at the Atoll.